Hi, everyone. We're going to move um, to our keynote speaker now. And I'd like to invite Tyler Warner, who's our, one of our two senior symposium editors, to come up to introduce uh, Charles Lee. Hello. First, um, I know this has been said many times, but I really do just want to thank Ben and Amy, um, and also Chelsea Gobb, I don't see her in here, who is um, one of our other uh, symposium editors who handled a lot of the logistics of today. But um, now it's my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker. And a little reflection, I think, would help to, to place uh, our, our keynote in context for today. So as we initially began to conceive of this, of this event, we didn't expect to have a keynote speaker. Obviously, that had nothing to do with the quality of today's speakers or the quality of the writers for the symposium issue of the journal. Rather, we thought that no single speaker could encompass the myriad of perspectives we hoped would be represented through this symposium. And then a colleague introduced us to Charles Lee, whose work spans both the history and the future of environmental justice, who has served as both an advocate and an academic, a passionate campaigner, and now in his role at the EPA as one of the chief policymakers of environmental justice. Um, Charles is a true pioneer in environmental justice movement. As you've heard, uh, his 1987 work, Toxic Wastes and Race in the United States, was a landmark in, environmental just in the environmental justice movement and would serve eventually to spur the executive order that today's event is celebrating. Uh, but Charles' most important contributions, has been said, have happened through his work at the EPA. And at the EPA, Mr. Lee has served um, in a number of efforts. He's led to incorporate environmental justice into EPA's rulemaking process, develop models for the collaborative problem solving, transform brownfields redevelopment into community revitalization, and as he's discussed already, to implement Plan EJ 2014. It's for all these reasons that I'm very excited to introduce today's keynote, Mr. Charles Lee. So um, hello again. Um, and it's, it's always great to get a second bite at the apple. You know, you remember all the things that um, you said, oh, we should have said that this morning and whatever, right? So I get a second chance. But, but um, first of all, I want to thank um, 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 the Duke Environmental uh, Law and Policy Forum and um, all the people that, um, you know, that organized this. Um, I really want to thank... Um, um, uh, the, then because, you know, but going back to uh, the February event, there were a lot of, um, you know, um, uh, the, uh, I guess challenges, yeah, <laughs> then those, and, uh, and they were really gracious in, um, in, um, in making sure that uh, my needs were addressed. Um, the, um, the, the other thing I want to do is to, um, is to thank all of you for being here, and, and I think that uh, it's really important to, to start uh, this talk by um, acknowledging the fact that, um, you know, you're here and you're here at Duke Law School because, um, and you're studying uh, law and environmental law because you um, uh, really want to um, help uh, improve people's lives. And to make, um, and in fact, to make a contribution to solving um, what arguably are some of the uh, uh, greatest challenges in, in facing, you know, all of us uh, writ large um, uh, uh, across the planet. Um, the other thing I want to do is to uh, recognize um, uh, all the all my colleagues here at EPA, EPA who are here, and I just want them to just stand. And some of them you met already, and some of them uh, um, uh, you might not have have met. But I uh, just want to make sure we do that. So Andrew and Sally and, uh, and great. 
And, uh, and then thirdly, I want um, a, a real special treat for me, um, and she um, uh, found out about this symposium last week um, uh, when I, I ran into her in um, Washington, D.C., um, a person who is a real hero for me, uh, and uh, that's Dolly Burwell. Uh, and, and for those of you that may not know, uh, Dolly was one of the um, uh, leaders, uh, organizers for the uh, historic uh, 1982 uh, protests in Warren County, North Carolina against the uh, uh, siting of a PCB landfill. Um, and um, uh, I, um, uh, I went to um, uh, uh, Warren County at that point and uh, meeting Dolly and others, um, you know, made me uh, see the uh, real um, importance of uh, the convergence between uh, issues of race and the environment, and that um, uh, set me on a on a path um, that has defined my life's work. And so, um, uh, you know, Dolly was um, uh, arrested five times. You know, uh, it, doing those protests, and um, and uh, there are a lot of stories that we can all tell you regarding that, and maybe you know we should at uh, some uh, uh, later, but I just want to tell one, and uh, and that had to do with um, uh, see a couple of years ago was a th was a thirtieth anniversary of the um, of the PCB protests, and. Um, and so I came down here and uh, uh, to speak, and Dolly showed me a fax of the of the persons who got arrested uh, at the Warren County protest and needed to uh, uh, bail bonds, um, and a, a bunch of them, uh, a large number of them, were Duke University students. And um, so I think it's really important to uh, for you for all of us to acknowledge and for you to recognize that Duke uh, University had played an important part uh, in making the history of environmental justice, uh, particularly at that very early crossroads. So I guess we should all give ourselves a round of applause, right? <laughs> so back then, um, you know, um, uh, the words environmental justice did not exist. Um, and um, I, shortly after, um, the Warren County protests, I went to work uh, for the United Church of Christ Commission for Racial Justice, which was the civil rights agency of the, um, of the United Church of Christ. Um, and um, I used to um, tell the board that, uh, of the commission that um, you know, they hired me to wor work on an issue for which there were no name. Uh, and, and so, um, and we have come a long way since then um, the Warren County protest led to the um, uh, a, a governmental accountability study that found three out of the four landfills, uh, hazardous waste landfill in EPA's Region 4, which are the, the eight southeastern states were located in predominantly uh, African American counties. Um, so, um, you know, as part of the um, part of the uh, the that, the the. Uh, project that I headed up, we went went around the country and uh, just um, went, came across um, just innumerable um, cases of uh, low income and tribal and communities of color that were suffering environmental hazards and, uh, and negative environmental impacts. So you know, we went to um, petrochemical plants in Louisiana. Um, you know, uh, Native American lands that were uh, being um, uh, had a hazardous waste, uh, including Alaska, uh, where it has a huge amount of military waste that are still left up there. We went to, um, I met Hazel Johnson, who some people say is the um, uh, godmother or the grandmother of the environmental justice movement. Uh, Hazel um, was the person that founded um, the first environmental organization in an African-American housing project. So um, as uh, history unfolded, um, we now know that um, there was a young organizer in Oak Elk Gardens uh, in the south side of Chicago uh, named Barack Obama. 
And so this is part of the, you know, this is what uh, part of what he brought uh, um, to, um, um, uh, you know, in terms of his experiences um, when um, he became president. And it, it really is reflected uh, in how the White House treats this issue. Um, so um, I decided, um, you know, after going around the country and everybody asked, uh, was asking the question, so what does civil rights have to do with environment? Um, and, um, you know, and virtually everyone asked that. Um, and, and so I, I said, we need to find a way to put the issue on the map. And so I said that, um, you know, I got the idea that the uh, GAO study needed to be replicated nationally, and that's what led to um, toxic waste and race in the United States. And all the reasons and, how, and the, you know, why was, we were able to start to do that, we can discuss later, um, you know, having to do with the existence of national databases and, you know, um, all the, and the ability to start to map things and, you know, um, so on and so forth. But, um, you know, it really did, uh, it, the, the idea was, uh, in my mind, was to really kind of put this issue on the map. And, um, and I, like I said earlier, um, you know, the, the upsurge of, um, of uh, recognition uh, and activity as a result in uh, communities of color uh, was just um, amazing to me. And uh, it just um, um, hit a chord in terms of an issue uh, in this country that was always there. But, you know, we had never been able to kind of put a finger on it. And so, um, you know, that uh, and many, many other things um, uh, led to um, the, the, uh, the issuance of um, Executive Order 12898 by President Clinton. And, of course, uh, 2014 is the 20th anniversary. It's also the 50th anniversary of the passage of the Civil Rights Act, and these are not un, uh, related things. So I thought, and I really appreciated the, um, you know, your um, wanting to uh, bring, uh, hold, having this symposium, because you know, we thought that it would be great to use the entire year to really kind of um, bring attention to the 20th anniversary and to, um, to reaffirm a commitment to environmental justice um, and to look at what progress we made and where we need to go and to kind of recharge ourselves, you know, for, um, uh, you know, some pretty important work uh, going into the future. So I think we're off to a, a great start. Uh, on February 11th, President Obama issued a proclamation, you know, to, affir to affirm or reaffirm our commitment to environmental justice. Uh, Administrator Gina McCarthy declared February as uh, Environmental Justice Month at EPA um, as the kickoff to a, a year-long set of activities. Um, and uh, there was a number of things that she um, committed to in that, uh, the most important of which are the um, completion and rollout of the um, of the uh, key um, uh, 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 deliverables from Plan EJ 2014. So that's rulemaking guidance, you know, uh, guidance around permitting, uh, the a nationally consistent uh, screening tool, um, uh, cumulative risk uh, policy, uh, um, and so on and so forth. And so. Um, so this is something that, you know, we're going to uh, see unfold over the rest of the year. Um, on February 11th, um, I um, uh, was privileged to write the um, Peace for EPA's Environmental Justice in Action blog um, uh, to mark the 20th anniversary. And I, um, in it, I reflected on the impacts of um, the executive order after 20 years. Um, and so this is is going to constitute uh, primarily uh, the bulk of what I'll discuss today. And um, I think um, just to put it in context, um, uh, the executive order uh, was indeed a product of community activism, and, um, and um, which in fact is the core of the environmental justice movement. Um, and um, I, I think uh, it, it is a real um, abiding truth 
that uh, environmental justice, uh, for environmental justice, that this community activism has played a role in inspiring and catalyzing uh, many truly visionary developments. Um, and I think um, what I try to do is try to try to link that to all the uh, things I saw as the uh, major um, um, impacts of the uh, environmental justice executive order. So first, um, uh, the executive order helped to amplify this community action, um, and um, and and uh, I think there um, it has been remarkable all the things that have uh, happened in communities uh, that are, um, that are uh, really um, cutting edge and make a really important difference in people's lives um, and um, build, um, to, together build um, a, um, a vision of what healthy, equitable, and sustainable communities really looks like. And, uh, and some of these, um, um, uh, examples, uh, and there are countless uh, of them, and Danielle uh, kind of talked about a few of them uh, earlier, and the, I'm sure the panel after this is going to talk about more of them, but just a few of them. Um, back in um, as early as 1992, uh, uh, community groups got um, uh, fuel tanks uh, relocated in East Austin, Texas. Um, uh, uh, communities like Spartanburg, South Carolina, uh, uh, revitalized their, uh, 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 cleaned up their hazardous waste sites and moved to a, um, uh, a, a vision of, com of wholesale community revitalization. Uh, in Spartanburg, um, uh, an organization called Regenesis started with a $20,000 uh, environmental justice, EPA environmental justice small grant as, and now has leveraged over $200 million. Uh, and, um, and, and that is, you know, just a model that many other communities are, are, um, are, are emulating. Um, in Port Arthur, Texas, um, a, uh, the housing project uh, near the um, Motiva uh, petrochemical plant was relocated. Uh, and um, and it wasn't just relocated because it was part. It became part or the centerpiece of a uh, redevelopment of that area or, or the that side, the west side of Port Arthur, where that space is going to become a greenway, and uh, and it's going to anchor that redevelopment um, in San Diego. Um, you know, uh, 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 for many years, the Environmental Health Coalition had um, uh, um, uh, used um, uh, uh, health community health workers, promotoras, to uh, educate um, and, um, and, 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 and um, uh, lead campaigns to clean up and, uh, the communities. And recently, a couple of years ago, uh, they passed a zoning ordinance ordinance for um, an area called National City. Um, and you know, and um, uh, communities are now coming up with this idea of, of, of building um, uh, green zones, um, you know, for not just to prevent and mitigate, but also to uh, transform communities into he truly healthy and sustainable ones. Uh, you know, the Kansas City, there's a green impact zone. Um, there's a um, number of efforts in, in California. Uh, there are other ones that has, you know, goes way back. Um, the Fruitvale Transit Village in the, uh, you know, uh, in Oakland, California, um, and we can, you know, just go on and on. So I think alongside this, um, uh, this, you know, these community um, efforts. Um, models have uh, begun to emerge, tools, right, uh, like zoning or ordinances, uh, like the use of geographic information systems and, you know, and, um, and assessment uh, tools. And, um, and, and so um, I think, you know, if you take this broadly across the expanse of uh, U.S. society, um, you know, we, we, were, we see how this has begun to permeate, permeate um, you know, many, many different sectors. So like public health, 
Uh, I think somebody said once that um, you know environmental justice is now a part of the main street of public health activity. You know, and you know I said this morning about how uh, NIEHS supported the tens of millions of dollars community-based participatory research, and this is in you know uh, lots and lots of uh, universities and communities. Um, the um, Dr. Beverly Wright was going to be here, but she wasn't. But you know, she was uh, back way back when um, uh, began one of the early uh, environmental justice resource centers, um, like along with Professor Bob Bullard, um, and um, and and now I think hundreds of universities offer uh, EJ courses or uh, clinics around environmental justice. There is, in fact, uh, at the University of Michigan School of Natural Resources, a PhD program in environmental justice. Um, and I'll talk more later. Uh, states and local government have legislation, policies, or programs. So, um, you know, the way I would sum it up is that whereas um, environmental justice was virtually unheard of in 1994, today it really does have a a, a indelible foothold in the mainstream of society. Um, in fact, environmental justice is never going away. Um, so, secondly, um, the executive order provided direction on integrating environmental justice in um, federal programs. So, you know, I said this morning, um, back in the 90, going back to the 1990s. Um, um, EJ advocates began to articulate ideas about how to operationalize environmental justice in government programs. One of those was the um, uh, was the uh, recommendations around um, use of environmental statutes to address uh, environmental justice issues. Uh, they developed a model plan uh, for uh, public participation through the National Environmental Justice Advisory Council. Um, Recommendations on cumulative risk led to the CARE program, um, you know, brownfields redevelopment and community revitalization. Uh, but it wasn't until the Obama administration that EPA developed Plan EJ 2014, uh, this comprehensive roadmap, like I said, uh, that Administrator Lisa Jackson wanted to uh, have to make sure that uh, environmental justice is a part of every decision. Um, um, and um, the um, Interagency Working Group on Environmental Justice, which was established by the executive order, has been revitalized. One of the most important things that is uh, been working on is um, uh, resources um, for uh, considering environmental justice in the NEPA process. Uh, and I talked about that before as a touch, uh, NEPA being a touchstone of the executive order. Um, but I, I uh, I think to sum it up, however, um, progress um, has been, um, uh, I said this over and over again, painfully incremental with the um, you know, emphasis on the word uh, painfully. Um, it's going to take uh, uh, tenacious and long-term uh, effort to really integrate environmental justice into federal uh, programs. Um, Lisa Jackson said when she left EPA, that environmental justice truly remains the unfinished business of environmental protection. And so we need to stay the course. Um, and then the other point I will make around um, federal um, efforts is that we need to, uh, at this time, enlarge the framework for a, or frame a larger vision for the executive order to include uh, proactively uh, providing benefits essential for building host wholesale or wholesome and prosperous communities, things like health care, housing, transportation, jobs, economic development, a green space, food security. Um, and I think moving in that direction is really important because um, it, it will go a long way to uh, fulfilling the vision or the promise of the executive order by explicitly articulating how environmental justice is an integral part of the mission of all federal agencies, something which I think is not fully recognized yet. Uh, so lastly, um, thirdly, the uh, executive order, like I said before, 
provided a catalyst for action by states on environmental justice. Today, more than 40 states um, and U.S. territories uh, have uh, legislation, um, and the District of Columbia have legislation, policies, or programs on environmental justice. The, envi the executive order was a template uh, in many respects for state EJ efforts. And because I think of the push from communities uh, in different areas, we've seen some real um, important kind of uh, developments that have gone way beyond um, the executive order. And that, of course, is um, in California, like I said this morning, AB 1330, uh, that uh, looks at cumulative risk and toxic hotspots, SB 535, which designates, um, which designates 25% uh, 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 of greenhouse gas uh, reduction funds, which are ten, tens of billions of dollars uh, f to benefit um, EJ communities and the use of Cal Enviro screen uh, to identify uh, these communities. Um, Minnesota and cumulative risk uh, legislation, um, New York, the Article 10 power plant siting law, um, brownfield opportunities areas, programs, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, it is important to note that community advocates played an important role in shaping these efforts. And, uh, and these are important to me to point out because there was a direct link between that community act, uh, activism and the community vision and these particular um, alleged pieces of legislation. And this is not to discount a lot of other things happening in states, but I think that you know this is like the, um, uh, the, 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 the top of the food chain. And like I said, I want to emphasize again as we look into the future, to me these are in fact the harbingers of, of, the, of the future and they reflect an evolving vision of uh, EJ advocates and future direction of policy making um, and, um, and they really offer lessons as we go forward into the future. Um, so um, I want to conclude um, by not going to talk about all the things I wanted to say, but just conclude by, um, by um, uh, with, with, this, um, um, with these words. Um, the environmental justice executive order was uh, only one step in a long journey. Uh, we must continuously evolve EJ vision and action to meet the opportunities and challenges of the 21st century. We have certainly come a long way since 1994 when most decision makers were groping for answers to elementary questions like what is environmental justice. Uh, and incredible opportunities have been created by the good work of all parties. So we must rise to the paradigmatic challenges created by climate change, increasing health and income disparities, equitable development, sustainable communities, globalization impacts such as goods movement or the movement of freight and other issues. Um, uh, notably, challenges with the use of Title VI of the Civil Rights Act still persist, and environmental justice issues will uh, be, as uh, Administrator Selly um, pointed out, uh, local, regional, national, and international. Uh, if we are uh, to rise to these challenges, um, and I think, um, you know, I point these words especially towards those of you uh, here at Duke Law School um, um, who are indeed going to be the leader, the, the generation of uh, new generations of environmental justice leaders uh, that we must nurture. Um, we must nurture leaders who are knowledgeable about how to work in both communities and institutions and armed with stellar technical and legal skills, and most important, guided by audacious vision and commitment. Thank you. Excuse me. And we have about 15 minutes for a question and answer, so. I can start us off. So I think that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change recently released another report saying that the, the bulk of the effects of global warming either are being felt or are going to be felt by some of the poorest countries in the world. So I was wondering what you see as the next steps as far as getting the kind of environmental justice dialogue that we have in this country 
translated to the, the international scale and sort of tying the knot between human rights and environmental justice, and like climate change? I don't know if I know how to answer that. <laughs> no, I think clearly, you know, that is, um, you know, important. Um, and I think clearly it's happening, you know, and I think, um, and, um, and I think that, um, you know, uh, issues of environmental in, uh, justice or injustice or inequity, you know, um, you know, are, have been reflected in, you know, the dialogue around, uh, you know, the, going back to, um, you know, uh, the, uh, the Rio um, uh, summit, you know, back in the, in the 90s, you know. Um, I do think that, um, I do think that, um, um, uh, and, and they emerge around all different kinds of issues. And I think some of the ones that the ambassador talked about are, are, the, are those. And I think that um, it is, um, so it is really, really important to, uh, it is that this is really important, and it is really important that this, this has been happening. Um, in this country, I think, um, you know, um, one of the, um, one of the um, uh, concerns of um, the EJ advocates around um, the, um, the Climate Action Plan is that it focuses more on ensuring that, uh, uh, that disadvantaged, overburdened communities are um, being addressed, the issues are being addressed. And, um, and, and again, I don't think that's not happening but I think that we can make it much more systematic. And so I think that, um, you know, um, uh, that's, that's why I look to SB 535 as being really important because it is like really unprecedented that something like that would happen. And, you know, if we can make that, make something like that, you know, really part of the dialogue, uh, I think we'll get to a really, uh, an important piece of this, which is, as we all said over and over again, without resources, you know, uh, what we're talking about is just words. And, uh, and you should know, I just, um, I got an email this morning about how the organizers of that workshop on SB 535 just had a conversation with senior officials at the White House. So I think we we'll, this is all going to come together. And, um, and in fact, a number of them um, um, are uh, members of the President's task force, the one that he task for, he put together of um, uh, 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 local, state, and tribal leaders. So, you know, hopefully we're going to get all this started to um, really, um, you know, come together. And we hope uh, through, um, you know, the interagency working group on environmental justice to offer up many of the tools that have been developed over the last uh, four or five years and begin to bring them to bear, um, you know, on, on that discussion. So I don't think the question is that um, it hasn't, uh, that, that isn't being addressed, but I think we need to make it systematic. And so, um, so, so that's how I would a answer your question. Um, I think that in this audience, of, uh, I'm seeing so many youthful faces. There's a lot of uh, anticipating job opportunities. And I know that at least one company uh, sends a representative to the Environmental Justice uh, Advisory Committee meeting because she represents EJ issues for that company from the um, perspective of industry. Do you think this is a, going to be a growing trend, and is this a place where young people might you know, look for work, for jo meaningful jobs with industry? Um, so who um, Sally is talking about is a person named Deirdre Sanders, who works, uh, she's the Environmental Justice Tribal Program Manager for PG&E. Uh, in California, and so, and PG&E is actually the only company that actually has an environmental justice policy, um, um, and so I think that's pretty far out there, right? Um, but I I think that um, you know many uh, companies, more and more companies are beginning to realize 
uh, that the, the issues that, are, that environmental justice speaks to, uh, like, for example, uh, corporate responsibility, uh, sustain, sustainable development, or um, you know, being a good neighbor, community involvement, are all interrelated. And I'm seeing more and more companies actually, you know, really try to take uh, part in meaningful dialogue. So, for example, the other part of this was um, the other um, part of that Port Arthur story, you know, in terms of the relocation of the, um, of the housing project is Valero um, um, uh, 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 oil company um, uh, putting money um, uh, into the creation of a health clinic. So there's a lot of things like this. Um, and, um, you know, um, I don't know if the answer is that any of these companies are going to actually hire an environmental justice, quote unquote, uh, manager or, 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 but I think that, you know, people that go to work for these companies um, should you know, um, and, and can uh, meaningfully raise these issues as part of the, the way that companies do business. Omega, oh, Omega or, it's up to you, or? I just wanted to dovetail to what, uh, what was noted in your previous responses. Um, the President Obama uh, issued the Memorandum of Understanding in August of 2011 for environmental justice and got, uh, was it 19, 17, 18 federal agencies to sign on and write their own environmental justice strategies. And one of the ones that was most comprehensive and most beautifully written was uh, the Health and Human Services which was rolled out right here in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. I was asked to be one of the people who participated in two and a half days of reviewing it. One of the most difficult things, though, and one of the most surprising things is the people from the Department of Health, and this goes back to what Amy said earlier, were not allowed to participate in that rollout, which was a very odd sort of thing. We have state officials who are contacting me, a community person, at lunchtime and asking me what is going on when they weren't allowed to drive nine miles. The basic question is, does this SB 535 creates the avenue for the movement of the policy to the state and local level? Is that included in there? Because clearly that's a state that's a state piece of legislation. So, so I'm saying so we still so you're saying to us still even with this brand new landmark policy that's coming out that you were talk, you talked about several times today, it still does not include the key to making federal policy proactive at the local and state level. But that's a California statute that's applicable to California agencies. And, um, you know, whether or not it or the model that it creates or the ideas that it engenders are going to get to the, the, the issues that you talk about you asked about, you know, well, that remains to be seen. No. Can, can I just respond a little bit, yeah, Omega? You know, I, the, and, uh, I'm going to start a little esoteric, but I'm going to come back around to that. In our most recent PM 2.5 NACs, National Ambient Air Quality Standard, for the first time we had enough information to link um, low income as a susceptible population to PM. And we are currently working on our rules for the states or guidance for the states and how to develop the state implementation plan. And that proposal will be coming out within a month or two. I can't remember exactly the dates. But it might be a great opportunity for folks to make comment to the agency on that rule on, you know, you know, you'd like to see state programs in, in, you know, like the California rules, you know, if the, the final implementation rule points to some of those good state programs out there, that might be a way to bring it more broad than just California. 
And I got my plug in for PN 2.5 because I forgot <laughs> it this morning. <laughs> Dolly, did you, well, did, did, you I, I, was, did I help you, Omega? Well it, well, it clarifies and creates an understanding that we still have a huge gap between federal policy, uh, landmark policy in California, and what's happening in other right. states like this state right here where we sit. Right. And, and, and no, and I think everyone recognizes that. Uh, so this is something that we all need to, this is part of the next frontier, I think. <laughs> <laughs> the wild frontier. <laughs> yeah, I, I had a comment and sort of question, but I think it was halfway um, connected to Omega's question because back uh, last August, I uh, had an opportunity to visit again with the United Church of Christ. And to my surprise, I was told by the Justice and Witness Agency that one of the most requested documents still was the, uh, by communities, was the Toxic Waste and Race Report. And so, and I was surprised that that document was still being so widely requested. In fact, they have reprinted it um, a couple of times. And, and I guess um, since, since I believe that that document was a catalyst for national policy, what would you say is, and maybe it's the California piece of legislation that, that communities in North Carolina could connect to today to try to, um, you know, uh, deal with issues like fracking and coal ash and that kind of thing? Well, you know, I mean, the, the, um, the, the, the there are many things happening in California, right? And there are many things happening in other parts of the country, like the other, you know, pieces of legislation. We can all learn from them. Uh, and every situation is going to be different. And you got to understand that these are all very focused around certain issues. And so the one that, you know, I talked to has to do with um, the greenhouse gas reduction fund proceeds and how they, they get used. And so that, you know, if there are other situations where it's similar, that could become a model. But it's not going to be uh, the thing that solves fracking uh, because it doesn't speak to that. So I was just wondering, you mentioned the, the green zones that have sort of popped up across the country um, in various jurisdictions. And one of the barriers, it seems, chiefly in local communities to that is the in creating the incentives for um, green industry or uh, sort of non-noxious <laughs> businesses to come in. And, and this may be one way um, one way of many to sort of bridge the federal local gap. Um, and I don't know very much about the grant programs, but I guess my question is, to what extent do, does the EPA, EJ type grants um, facilitate that kind of incentive? Or is there not that kind of connection at this point? Well, you know, the, um, the EPA environmental justice grant programs are meant to um, I mean, they're very small, $25,000. Um, and, you know, this year we're going to give $100,000 grants, but fewer grants, you know. Um, and, and they really are meant to build capacity in communities, and then, you know, the communities can decide, you know, what kind of specific um, uh, issues they want to address. I mean, the, as long as they're within the, um, you know, underlying statutes that, you know, govern these the grant program. Um, you know, I, I think that um, um, there. Uh, so we are encouraging communities to look at things like that uh, to get from you know community starting and most communities, as you know, just start with like this is my immediate problem and you know I have a hazardous waste site or I have you know um, I need to do education about lead or things like that, right? Um, you know, we also, we, I, I think we need to get communities to start thinking about, you know, things that you're talking about. 
uh, and to really kind of come up with uh, different different uh, strategies and approaches. Um, again, I go back to California. One of the other things that uh, you know was a pretty interesting thing to me was a law that uh, called for distributed uh, um, uh, solar power systems, which means that essentially you put uh, solar panels in people's you know, on rooftops, but the the way that they did it was that 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 could be the, that sh, that is encouraged to be done in communities. So then it's a source of um, you know employment, economic development, as well as renewable energy and energy um, you know cost savings for for uh, for communities. So the, you know there are things like that. Um, um, I don't know of any. Um, any other um, specific grant programs um, at the federal level that you know that are similar to that? So um, thank you so much, Charles, for coming in. And um, so I guess everyone, please join me. Thank you.